this week's Property Matters, the show that brings global trends to an Irish audience to help shape your knowledge of the industry. We're on Twitter at iProperty Radio or email at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Your host today are myself, Brian Fox, and Carol Tallon. Okay, and in news this week, the latest housing market monitor showed that uh, 5,800 housing completions were registered in the first three months of the year. So that's actually up um, 31.6% on this time last year. Uh, however, according to RTE today, construction activity growth has actually eased to a four month low. So we'll have more on that next week. Um, according to figures by the Central Bank, there were close to 40,000 mortgages to the value of 8.9 billion originated last year. And more on property tax, the Minister for Finance, Pascal Donoghue, is apparently planning for modest increases in property tax when the deadline for re-evaluating how much householders will pay comes around next year. And some important news, the Residential Tenancies Amendment Act 2019 has now come into effect, changing the law for landlords and tenants. So both landlords and tenants and, of course, estate agents and managing agents are encouraged to go to onestopshop.rtb.ie to find out how these changes will affect you. And And finally, Dolphin Park development plans have been rejected by Dublin City Council. The proposals included floodlights, new training, um, all-weather pitch, a new gym, changing rooms and new meeting rooms. And the plans also involved actually the construction of 153 apartments, seven townhouses and one detached house by Belgrove Homes. Under the proposals, 28% of Dolphin Park would have been under concrete and that was heavily objected to and those plans have been rejected. Thanks, Carl. Some interesting news there. Now, because there's no property legislation being debated or motions discussed in Leinster House this week, instead we will discuss placemaking. Now, placemaking is becoming an interesting, an increasingly interesting part of the property conversation. This week, a European-wide initiative is taking place to make people more aware of the idea of connecting people to a place for the human dimension. So, Carl, I just want to put it to you. Is this a buzzword in the construction industry or is there something more to it? Um, Look, I'm not cynical so no, I don't think it's a buzzword. Placemaking, it's definitely not a new concept. It has been around for decades and it goes beyond property development. In fact, originally it used to refer really to public spaces, green spaces, um, you know, the areas that communities and businesses use and I think it's fitting this week because it is Placemaking Week Europe uh, Uh for 2019 and not a whole lot is happening in Ireland so I made it my mission to tell somebody every day every day this week that it's Placemaking Week and to explain what placemaking is so you know, in short, it really is um, about a more holistic approach to urban development. Okay. So, yes, it's taking the green spaces, taking in the places where people live, work, um, spend time mm-hmm. and and where they are raising their families and socialising. Mm-hmm. And all of these things have to be looked at holistically. We can't just look at property developments. Yes, we're in a housing crisis. Yes, we need to deliver new homes. Yes, our planning system is broken and we need to speed up the delivery of new homes and vital infrastructure because remember we have had a lost decade of infrastructure but this needs to be done right so it's a new way of looking at planning it's new to Ireland it's new to Ireland it's definitely not new it's really how things should have been done in the past one of the things that interests me is that um, we have Irish property developers in the UK the likes of Ballymore who are considered the best in placemaking and they're amazing when they go into London like their recent Embassy Gardens development and they don't seem to put the same emphasis on placemaking here in Ireland. Now I have to assume that's because either the system doesn't support it or they feel it's not required. So look I, I think now is the time that we actually start a conversation about placemaking. Let developers know that there is a good way to do this. And by the way, much of placemaking um, that's done right, particularly here in Dublin that we see, that's actually driven by developers. Um, local authorities and local planners certainly have an interest in this area. But there's a few... Really so in other words then, is the, is the developer that sees an opportunity within some some real estate, we'll say, some property, right? They decide then to go to the bank and see if they, they can negotiate a loan to develop on the on the area and get planning permission. Is that as simple as that? Or? Oh, no, no, no. Actually, not at all, because what you're talking about there is property development. Mm-hmm. Placemaking goes so far beyond that. In fact, the developer, in for good placemaking, the developer would actually start with the principle that the people living in the area right. or the people working in the area know best. Okay, so, so he fact, goes to the... Consult with he them, goes to the developer, goes to... Okay. To, goes to the community, listens to what they have to right. say, and, and like so all So it's consultation. Things, Absolutely. In a public consultation for property development is a statutory requirement in Ireland, but placemaking takes it a step further. It makes it a little bit better. It's the old school town, or the old town, sorry, old school is the expression, um, mm-hmm. but really the old fashioned town hall events. But what's happening now is that we're seeing a digitisation of 
the placemaking process. So we're seeing virtual town halls. And so that's the project Place Engage that we discussed a few weeks ago here on the show. Um, so essentially, you're really communicating with the community, not just at public town halls, but you're communicating where they are. And that's typically on their uh, smartphones sitting at home. A, a good example sofa. of that may be then what's happening in, in Dundrum in terms of the new developments in... in Absolutely. Yeah. Imagine Dundrum. Imagine Dundrum. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, actually, um, Dundrum is a really interesting one because you're talking about a place where, you know, 5,000 residents, but actually up to 20,000 people coming into the area and commuting to and from the area for work every day. And yet when a town hall event is held you might get 140, 150 people. Mm-hmm. So that's not indicative of the opinions of 20,000 people. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're doing wrong in terms and, of And are Irish, are Irish people reluctant to get involved in that type of community interaction with developers? Um, yes, there's definitely been a cycle of trust broken and that's just the reality of the situation. I think um, property developers, certainly their reputations were damaged, like many reputations damaged uh, during the, the crash and during the recession. And that's not always well-founded. Um, so in fact, we have some really great placemaking initiatives coming from property developers at the moment. But what we see is there's a breakdown of trust in a whole circle. So um, I'm not sure that developers trust planners. I'm not sure that planners trust the public for the public part of public consultation. Um, And I'm really not sure that the public trust property developers. So we have this whole cycle of people who need to work together to create great spaces Mm -hmm. and the trust has really broken down. So, in fact, one way to fix that would be to make more information available. You know, all of the documents in relation to planning um, should be publicly accessible, but and even though they are legally publicly so totally available, totally yeah, but what happens is they are legally available, but they're difficult to access. They're locked right. away in PDFs right. on, on badly navigated um, government websites. So, in fact, what we need to do is get all that information up front, educate people and then show them what the property development will look like, the proposed development. So one of the ways we're doing that is actually by using immersive technologies. Um, and that's actually what we do through Place Engage. And again, we discussed this here a few weeks ago, but essentially not everybody can read plans. Not everybody can um, interpret what those plans will look like even the CGI images don't give any context Mm. so let's show people we have the technology now everybody has a mini computer in their pocket allow them through immersive technologies to experience what the proposed development will look like Mm -hmm. before it's built Mm -hmm. so we want people to engage because planning is a public process Mm -hmm. it's so important to keep repeating this when you say people engage are you talking about the bus company are you talking about uh, the local uh, the the um, the, um, Put back the, the, the Tesco's and they've done stores coming in and participating in, oh, in the, yeah, in the conversation. Local businesses, local businesses are part of the community. Local residents are part of the community. Homeowners are part of the community. Tenants are part of the community. People who are coming into an area to work mm-hmm. form part of the community. And in fact, in a city centre, that's um, and, and certainly in, in urban areas, that can be a difficult balance to achieve. But you have to make everybody who's coming in living in an area using an area dining in an area socialising in an area coming in to play sports people need to feel like they're part of the community and that they have a say because actually legally they do Right and just just before we go go off this topic you you were saying there at the top that it's new to Ireland obviously it's been this this is something that's already been employed in other countries around Europe Oh it absolutely has and in fact actually um you know, I, I, I don't know what the legal definition might be or the technical definition would be, but actually if you look at um the Guinness built homes, that was mm. placemaking. Oh, okay. You know, um yes. the as Trust. in uh, abs- well but we actually have a history of employers creating spaces for their for their employees. employees. Right. So it's definitely not a new concept. In fact, if anything, we've lost it over the last couple of, okay. of years CIA, or decades. They did some come back. developments in Ijikor, didn't they, for the rail workers as well? I think. Yeah, and that's how that's how properties got mm. developed. That's mm. how people on, uh, particularly working class people, were able to to access homes. Right. So, in right. fact, we need this. Um, it's a return to it. But I think what's interesting, what we're seeing in Placemaker at the moment, is that we're seeing that the interests of the local communities um and the citizens they're far more aligned to property developers and the local authorities than our adversarial system would allow us to believe so actually when you drill down to the bottom of it we all want the same thing we want great spaces to live work socialise and spend and, time uh, we're all we're well. all yeah. on the same side for yeah, this yeah. alright um, interesting one um, we might as well turn now to our next guest uh, to our first guest actually it's Brian McCarthy Senior, senior Negotiator and Value at Doran Estate Agents Brian, welcome Brian Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. So tell us, how did you first get involved with uh, property, uh, with estate management and estate Uh, agents? uh, 
it's a long time ago, I suppose. Well, a relatively long time ago, I suppose. Late in my school life and and uh, and early into my professional life, I, I always had an interest in property. Um, and I suppose earlier school jobs, summer jobs, stuff like that. It was always a kind of a selling or a wheeler, wheeling and dealing kind of a in property. Uh, um, well, I suppose initially in anything I could get into, and uh, when I was uh, dealing with. A, a, a very, very close friend of mine, uh, Eamon Nealon, uh, who was our career guidance teacher at the time, uh, he led me in the direction of, of, of property sales Probably, and yeah. transactions. Yeah. And uh, it was a difficult time, I suppose, the first five or six years of my career. I was trying to find uh, find my way and, and a global financial crash came in the way, you know, early on. But yeah. uh, kind of into 2011 again, I got back into it and... and I'm at it more or less since. Yeah, you're off air there. You were saying too that you were in Australia for a couple of years. Yeah, I spent 2013 to 15 in Australia. Um, when I got to Australia first, I started working for a company out there who'd be one of the top three in residential sales, a company called Ray Weiss. Uh, I learned an awful lot there. I learned an awful lot about their treatment of vendors, their acquisition of business and, and stuff like that, but it's a very, very different it's a very, very different model to the Irish model. In what way? Um I suppose it's not very personal. Oh really? Um, yeah. A lot of a lot of the Australian model is contact and data and I mean we're all being told of the importance of our data now. Uh, and certainly it's becoming more relevant here, but I'm not sure if parking your car at the top of an estate in Dundrum and knocking on 80 or 90 doors for the day to get people's personal information is quite going to catch on here. Is that what they do in Australia? Yeah, literally. Um, uh, so as in, that's the business development, the, that's the The business the development model is just data. So when 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 guys are learning their trade or, or people are brought in, they're either on the phone um, or they're knocking on doors get to get people's information. Um, I suppose the model in Perth at the time... Um, there were statistics there to say no one was staying in any house on an average more than seven years, so the turnover was high. Mm-hmm. Um, you're talking of a city with a population of about 1.3 million. And is that because they see it as an investment? Or, um, or I suppose you're you're climbing the ladder, essentially, but um, people... But that's how, that's how regularly they were able to do this, like people were able to upgrade their homes every seven years. Yeah. Wow. It was, it, 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 seven years was being taken as an average figure that a property mm-hmm. transaction would take place. Um, no, unfortunately, I suppose high divorce figures and different things like that would contribute to that mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but the statistics we were being given was that that every house you're calling to or every door you were knocking on, everyone you're speaking to on the phone would require a property service within a seven-year period. Um, and they were working on, you know, being the, the go-to once that idea mm-hmm. came into their head that I need somewhere to sell, well, let's, you know go to the people that have been feeding us with information four times a year for the last how did years. How did people react to that? I'm not it sure. Was, Would you like that? Somebody no, coming to your door? It was difficult. Well, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're talking about guys in a call centre situation with a headset on and a, a, they're looking at a, like a, a dialing 400 numbers a week. You know, maybe getting actually having a conversation with 80 people and turning that into... 10 or 15 uh, pieces and of people data. would actually volunteer that information well you're talking about 400 phone calls getting you maybe 20 pieces of information oh, right. so your turnover figure was low and the other 380 could be anything from it just hanging up the phone to you know I'm not interested you know the more polite one was I'm not interested thanks very much yeah uh, I had a I'm sure they don't em- all say yeah, thank you yeah I had an employer one time who you know I said no one was answering the phone I was calling during the day and he said start calling at dinner time you know at 6 o'clock in the evening and that was there, a are there laws against that now? Because uh, there are in many jurisdictions. There are many jurisdictions. I'm not sure that there was that time. Mm. Even the, the directory, uh, you know, the, the, the white pages, as we would have called them here one time, were available online that time. And people had to opt out, essentially, for them not to be contacted. No, it was happening at an, at, a, at an alarming rate that people were opting out because yeah. more and more companies were, were electing mm. to call, call them, essentially. But I suppose the, the one thing that these residential property sales companies had over anyways they weren't selling anything at the time yeah all they wanted was information so name address you obviously had their address email phone number and then they started contacting people four times a year with relevant oh, information yeah. would, would you regard it as aggressive uh yeah, yeah. that would be one description yeah. for it i guess yeah, yeah. i just like as i say that is important and and we're all being told about the importance of data and we have to keep our clients 
and our potential customers updated but this was to a whole new level that I just don't think the Irish Well, it, it's not adding would. value. You know, I, th- I think Irish companies now, particularly in the post-GDPR world we live in, um, you in order to, to extract data from people, it's an exchange. So you have to be giving something of value in order to get that data. Well, well they were. Once once they, the data received, then people were getting a kind of a quarterly market update mm. of mm-hmm. market conditions and, and, and et cetera in their area, which is, you know, something that's, that's creeping in here and all. But you want to be feeding it to people uh, that it's relevant data as opposed to, to, to spamming people as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you're working now with Doran Estate Agents. So what area does that take in? Doran Estate Agents, well, the Doran's um, originally originated in the, in the Tal area. Frank Doran and his daughter, Bridget Ann, established the company um, a few years back. Uh, they would have been involved in the purchase of, for their clients, many properties. And, and, and no, it's it's... It's a vast spread of County Dublin, kind of Meath and Kildare, um, and and everywhere in between. And um, they have a vast array of of loyal clients, um, which I'm only getting into. But it's it's interesting work. And you're quite the, new to the company. I'm just entering my second month. So oh, really? Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. yeah, I'm really enjoying it, and it's a great challenge. And there's a very very close knit community of clients there and it's, it's interesting to see in Dublin it's something I may be used to from from a country approach but it's, it's, it's a family run business and it's very evident that it is and their clients are family friends and, and they have a lot of stuff going on and they're they're you know giving people free advice on a daily basis and it's 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 so really it's a complete interesting. departure from your experience in Australia isn't yeah it? well it would, it would be it would be the the, the person touch friend, would yeah. be would yeah, be non-existent yeah, in yeah, Australia yeah, I suppose yeah, you'd say. Yeah. well actually I, I think that leads to to a question that has come up here before and that is you know we're at a time when there's a chronic shortage of homes we have um buyers first-time buyers and people looking to trade up and down uh, l- literally pouncing on new houses as they come to the market so I, I would imagine there's no difficulty selling homes, but how do you go about actually listing properties? What are the what are the business development techniques you're using at the moment to actually list properties in the Dublin, Meath and Kildare area? Yeah, well, I suppose th- there's there's different models, and I mean we'll always say that, and and maybe people that don't understand the industry as much someone thinks they're giving you a customer when they provide you with someone who's looking to buy a house and unfortunately that's not the case yeah. I suppose we don't I'm sure you still welcome those we, we still welcome them and, and every house has to be sold and, and I mean um, our industry at times would have uh, I suppose negative feedback on the way maybe purchasers are treated I'd always take it upon myself to have a duty of care towards purchasers and to give them the time of day because they'll all they'll all require further services in the future. But um, it, I, I think, uh, sorry to cut across you there, but I think it is so important to point out that estate agents work for the seller. They're paid by the seller and they work for the seller. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, our, our fee is paid by the seller and, and that's who we're responsible to, um, you know. I suppose the, the old adage we were often saying someone gives out about an, uh, an estate agent I tried to buy a house off him and it got too expensive and he, you're getting bad publicity for that but that's actually what the we're market. employed to do mm-hmm. um, we're employed to act in the best interest of a seller um, but there's no there's no harm in, in taking that little bit of time to give a duty of care to a purchaser as well Yeah of course I mean to look the, obviously the, the smart thinking is those buyers um, beyond just being professional, those buyers are going to be your customers in a number of years as well. Yeah, not not everybody probably mm. thinks that way, but mm. um, it's certainly the way I would judge it. And um, you know, some of the bigger firms possibly are in danger of just you know, if if one buyer is interested on to the next one and and whatever you know, and 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 not maybe giving them that time of day, but. It's it's a model that I've done and I felt it served me well. Oh, very good. And tell me, in, on the technology side of things, have you started to embrace online bidding and different types of technology to improve the process? We don't currently have an online bidding platform. Um, it's something that I would be well versed in and done a lot of research in and I'm always keeping an eye on it. I'm not sure that, um, I'm not sure that it's quite there yet. I still think a property transaction to an Irish person is a touch ah, and feel transaction. Right. Um, I don't think, you know, I just don't think it's going to get there maybe as soon as everywhere else. Mm. That's an opinion that plenty would disagree with. The online bidding platform, I also think we're trained negotiators, uh, you know, over experience you get a way of dealing with people, a way of maybe judging their next move and stuff like that mm-hmm. and where an automated system is 
pushing someone to give another bit of a thousand euros they're on about the transparency of it but you know if it's only taking bids in thousand in thousand euro jumps where you think someone really wants it and to act in the best performance of your client so you can have a conversation with someone and say you know make an effort to buy this and there's a current offer of 200,000 and, and you know knock your competitors out and someone will go 215 to try mm-hmm. and buy that property which is something I've made a judgement call on well I, I just don't think AI is going so to do that So you would have preference you. then for the personal touch would you then as opposed to Still that? do I haven't been converted yet I'm open to I'm open to, to everything that's going on but um, And Doran's I suppose would be the same was it? Yeah uh, uh, we, as I say we don't embrace uh, an online bidding yeah, platform yeah, at the yeah, moment yeah. and I just don't think um, right now, that it's that it's quite there yet. Why, um, Brian? Is matter. Why, why do you think it's quite there yet? I, I, because we, I, 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 we got a people. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and um, but, uh, see, apologies, Brian. Uh, sorry, I realise I've got a Brian either side of me. <laughs> so, um, what's happening is that we have a huge focus on prop tech and on the show here, and so you know we probably hear so much about the pro technology side I do think it's interesting to hear a perspective to say well actually I'm not sure if buyers and sellers are sure. there yet and I and I think that's very likely true for some it's not the opinion I hold but I'm sure it is true for some buyers yeah, and sellers and, and and this is the thing I suppose we, we need we need both sides of the uh, defence and, and uh, you know trading in property is a very old trade and uh, I just think that having a professional on site um, you know, carrying someone through the transaction. It's a very, very important time in, in someone's life if they're sure. buying or selling a property. Yeah. Um, after their health, it's probably the most important transaction that they'll ever carry out. And we can pass that on to a computer-generated system to take care of, or we can t- keep taking care of it ourselves. And, and I just don't think that the, the Irish person as a whole is quite there yet to be to be leaving it all to AI. And, and you know, someone needs to be given a bit of yeah. a bit of care it's it's an expensive transaction estate agents i think are paid well enough for the job that they do to be able to to, to meet people and continue the the um I suppose the a large process. element of trust then as well on the one to one basis L- large element of trust on the one to one basis um you know there's often negative press around yeah. auctioneers and their accountability uh, it's improved the psra has certainly improved that mm. in 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 our accountability and and uh, and where we need to be accountable and um, it's something that maybe people aren't aware of but always if you're not sure about someone you're dealing with or something like yeah. that or if you want to get uh, retrospectively get a copy of, of bidding information you won't be given personal information but the PSRA will, will gather that information for you. Very good and finally just some advice before we let you go Brian just some advice for people maybe in their homes who are thinking of selling and sometimes mixed commentary on the market they mightn't be sure what way to go have you any final piece of advice for anybody who's considering selling at the moment? Um, selling at the moment I think there's, there's definitely there's definitely two tiers in Dublin at the moment some say plus or minus 400 I'm more of the opinion the rebuilding Ireland scheme as good as it was and while there was money available it was probably creating a breach of the market around the 320 mark where people in rebuilding Ireland could get up to 320 um, and anything plus that then was probably that bit more difficult um, there's you know there's there's gaining finance for anything over that mark then is is more difficult and people are into 20% and stuff like that so I suppose if people are trying to give themselves a timeline uh, be sure to give themselves plenty of time always do plenty of research and um, the one trick I think you know in in a place like Dublin where there's so much property for sale at the moment is pretend you're a buyer and head out on a Saturday and go to some open viewings that's right and and, um, you'll get an idea very quickly if somebody who's not gaining a fee from you, you get the right feel from. Very good. Um, nice. You know, the, the, you'll get an idea of, of who the best to trust with the sale of your property is. Okay, that's great advice, Brian. Thank you very much. That was Brian McCarthy, Senior Negotiator and Valuer at Doran Estate Agents. Coming up after the break, we're going to be looking at recruitment in the in the property industry and how to attract the top candidates. And such a We were always talking about a housing crisis, so now we're going to be talking about a skill shortage in the industry. So, coming up after the break, thank you very much, Brian. Broadcasting to South Dublin on 93.9. This is Dublin South FM. 
And welcome back to Property Matters here on Dublin South FM with myself, Brian Fox, and Carol Tallon. On Twitter, it's iProperty Radio, and on email, it's hello at iPropertyRadio.com. So now in studio, we have Phil Palucha. I hope I pronounced that name correctly, you did. Phil. Uh, you're, 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 you are the number one property group. Now, before we discuss or talk about your. Um, your your company and, and what you do. Mm-hmm. Tell us about yourself. Little. So originally from a uh, surveying background, as you can tell from the accent, I'm a, I'm not a local boy. Sure. Uh, I have a business partner over in Black Rocks. So I spend quite a lot of time over here doing some bits and pieces. It's uh it's it's really interesting to see the t- contrast between the two markets. To be honest, we're in we're in a very different place. Although ultimately. We suffer from a lot of the same pain points in I terms imagine. of recruitment or in terms of in uh, terms property. Of, yeah, I think both in both. terms of in terms of. I mean, it, there's a lot of similarities between the London property market and the Dublin property market. For example, mm-hmm. in terms of the shortages, in terms of the fact that it's not always easy to get the regulations and, and, and build in the way that you need to. Right. And we were discussing off air uh, mm-hmm. earlier, Carol, about how um, there aren't enough developers to be able to do the way. I think we probably mm-hmm. have uh, an opposite problem in terms of the UK. We have so many developers, but actually they're all vying over the same plot of land. Yeah, and, and all and concentrators. Fi- absolutely, yeah, and fighting yeah, in a very yeah. small area. I guess yeah. that's the joy of being from another small island, isn't it? I yeah. suppose that London will be very much to the fore in relation to that concentrated area, would it? Or, or yeah, so, so London is a difficult market. Obviously, London is a fantastic market to invest in, um, yeah. but it's a very difficult market to get into. It's one of those markets that if you had a time machine, everybody would go back and do it, wouldn't they? Probably same with the, the Dublin. In fact, mm. definitely same with the Dublin mm. area. Um, but I think a lot of the pain points actually come around the skill shortages. It's the stress in London as well. Ver- uh, uh, all over. It's a global, it's a global issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> I, everybody has their own thoughts and, and reasons as as to why they think that is. Um, for me, I actually experienced it firsthand. I, I graduated with a surveying degree around the same time that the property market fell off a cliff. Um, so well timed. Yeah, it was fantastic, wasn't it? <laughs> Nine thousand pound, really well spent. Or the only thing I would say is it was two years before our university fees went to nine thousand pound a year instead right. of nine thousand pound for the three. So um, I'm grateful for small mercies, I suppose. Um, but the, the the market kind of just ground to a halt very quickly, didn't it? And and my experience was that both in terms of the resi and the commercial market, anybody who wasn't a top performer that had one to three years post qualification experience at that point left the industry. Mm, yeah. um, or emigrated, I suppose. Exactly, or yeah. went to somewhere. Where, I mean, yeah. which I did. I went to South Africa to ah, go and find okay, work. So I, I did yeah. the exact yeah. same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, if it wasn't for the fact that I had personal circumstances which brought me back to the UK I probably oh, wouldn't I be back working yeah. in the UK market yeah. either and that's that's me being very honest even now even now I think yeah I mean it's it's a buoyant market but I think the only reason I'm working in that market now is because I now have a reputation in that market because sure. I've worked in it for the X amount of years now yeah. but yeah. had I not have had those personal circumstances I don't think I ever would have would have gone gone back I was quite happy in so <laughs> you never took up certain, is that what I was, you, you went into uh, recruitment didn't I you? did so it was actually completely accidental in South Africa yeah so so I, I was looking for an opportunity to kind of break into the market and I'd been offered a, a position with, with Savills um, okay. but it was kind of an internship it was based in London it was mm. um, the market wasn't great at that particular moment it was a commercial surveying position uh, there wasn't much going on by way of development so what was I going to be doing? Being an internship, it was a very low-paying role. And uh, very, again, similarities between London and Dublin markets. London is not a cheap place to live, yeah. um, especially on an internship salary. So I went back to one of my university lecturers who I had a great relationship with and said, what would you do? If you were in my shoes, what would you do? And um, thankfully, he had a uh, great contact at a company called Seif. Seif Properties are, or were the second largest real estate company in Africa at the time. I went and worked with one of their um, key offices, not their head office at that time, in Johannesburg. Um, but what was fascinating was their market, so it was a resi opportunity that I went and worked in, it was like a business consultant's role. But their market is about five or six years behind that of the UK. So having been a branch manager and self-funded my way through university, they were more interested in marketing techniques, recruitment tactics. Um, Recruitment, for example, over in South Africa at the time was very much a model of taking middle-aged people from one company to another. You know, I, I often joke that you could drive along the same stretch of road in Johannesburg and the only difference would be the for sale board with somebody's face on it would now have different branding on it two weeks later because they keep changing companies. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they weren't attracting new there people There was no in. new talent. No, there was no new talent coming through the industry at all. And I think a large part of that was um, 
for South Africa was that the it's regulated uh, as is as is Ireland. And I think they probably weren't as strict because I think there's a lot of the regulations here that do sort of tie your hands together a little bit, and that's from an outsider's perspective looking in. No, I think there's people um, in the industry that would agree with that as well. You mm. know, particularly for viewings. You know, we discussed earlier sure, that absolutely. in the in the US there's a trend of outsourcing viewings. I think yes. Irish estate agents from um, a sustainability of the business point of view would like to be able to do that, and they can't do that. Mm. Um, so I, I actually. I think that's a fair assessment as an outsider. Well, I think, you know, to compare that in contrast to the UK, for example, we don't, we, it's not a regulated industry in the UK at all. So actually we have completely different issues by way of people don't trust estate agents in mm-hmm. the UK. Um, well, that's always been, that's... Oh, very that much so. But I think, I think yeah. we've made it worse uh, over recent years. I mean, uh, there will be people smirking to themselves. I won't name people because I'll get myself in trouble. But there are, there are companies out there that hire salespeople from all sorts of different backgrounds, stick them through a two-week conversion course and mm. call them an expert. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. And that's just going to annoy the industry yeah. because they're not turning to you because they trust your judgment. So... Um, uh, part of the Federation for, for Independent Agents in the UK there's a lot of conversations going on about regulations and all this okay. kind of stuff we're the talent partner with them so um, Gray and Lot, Brian Mansell great guys to, to check out and go and have a look at what they do but they're, they're very key in the industry and we talk a lot about um, bringing in regulations into the UK market I think it is coming it needs to come mm. um, I'm hoping it's not as strict as the Irish market <laughs> I have no. to be perfectly honest yeah um, but I, I would like to see our market move from the unregulated estate agency market that it is today to more of the realtor market of, the, say, the US or Australia. In what respect? So certainly in this respect of instead of having the title of an expert, I actually want you to be the local expert. So um, a stark contrast, for example, would be, I said this to you off air earlier, didn't I? Estate agents speak estate agent language mm. and the only people that tend to understand that are other estate agents yep. Yep. Um, and they seem to think that that's what the market wants the vendor wants you to come and talk to them about a 2.7% increase in the street over the past five years they're not going to sell for another 20 years why do they why do they care about that you know they, they don't want to know that I mean some people will if it's an investment property but if you're moving into a house to raise your family mm. you want to know where the local schools are you sure. want to know where the, the health centre is mm. you want to know where a nice park is to go walk bus in your stations, dog bus station, station, station tube station, yeah, station yeah, yeah. restaurants how long is it yeah. going to take you to get to your favourite football mm. club stadium from here how far are the motorway networks and, and that very, that was very much the role of a traditional estate correct. agent in any town or village mm, correct and they, they, they were the go to person and whether they had their finger on the pulse, you know, they would be able to say such and such a high school has got a new principal, you know, they've been brought in because they're, they're fantastic X, Y and Z. Mm. This was the result. So if you're looking for somewhere to put your children, you probably can't go f- far wrong with that. I would, however, avoid this one because yeah. of X, Y and Z. And it's an impartial. I'm a local. I understand my area and I'm mm. going to share that knowledge with you. Mm. So it's sort of in, a, in, a, in a sense lacking authority. It's too sales focused. Um, it's it's less service and, and too much sales. And I think that's probably a byproduct of the recession because you know there were so many estate agents and there still are so many estate agents uh, yeah. within the UK that everybody was vying for the same business. So it was a race. It was a, you've got to get there before everybody else. Um, there's a, a byproduct of that again is this limbo fees of constantly lowering the bar and fees and trying to outdo each other. And that low seems to be models. particularly aggressive in the UK. Sure. We're not seeing that to the same extent in Ireland. However, last week on the show, we did have one of Ireland's only or certainly one of Ireland's very few fixed price mm. estate agencies in and you know they've certainly come in for criticism that they're driving the prices down yes. now their argument is that they're automating so much of it that they feel that's where the value sits and we don't know how that's going to pan out if it'll be sustainable in the long term but I think in the UK it's particularly aggressive there's a bit of a smash and grab approach to driving down fees. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. There's there was there were lots of companies that came out and kind of adopted that model and, and, and ran at it quite hard. There were also a lot of organisations that knew that the key to making this successful was brand awareness and marketing. So they raised a lot of money through different crowdsourcing and, and different venture capitalists to kind of raise the yeah. funds to do that. You know, it's interesting though. These these are not new concepts. You know, I can remember almost a decade ago writing about the property market and and explaining to buyers that actually estate agents role that they wear two hats they Mm. have two roles they are professional uh, marketeers yes. and they are professional salespeople Absolutely. and they wear each hat at a different time or a different stage in the process and one of the difficulties I think in terms of breakdown of trust is that all too often um, buyers meet 
estate agents when they're wearing their um, marketeer's hat, yes. you know, in order to attract them into the property and then they switch right. into sales mode into sales, yeah. and, and, and this jars w- with buyers and it's one of the problems that they had. But it raises something really interesting for me and I know this is something you're involved in mm. yourself, Phil. Estate agents used to be expert marketers. Correct. That's absolutely fallen away. Mm. I, and I cannot be convinced otherwise. Um, I, I think they've utterly fallen behind the trends in terms yes. of uh, marketing in a way that consumers want. Yeah, I think that what you've just said there, what consumers want in a way that consumers want, hits the nail on the head for me. Because I think going back to the estate agency language, that's estate agent speaks. That's how we speak to each other. It's not how the, the client wants to be spoken to. And it's about repositioning that. It's about asking the question once again, instead of telling the client what you think they want to know ask them what they want to know it's not a new concept is it it's but for me i think a lot of this comes down to passion um i talk about passion within property all the time um and it's one of the things that we drive really hard within our recruitment strategies you know you can be enthusiastic for a month or two months if someone's paying you to be but you can't be enthusiastic about something for for a consistently long period of time unless you're genuinely enthusiastic about it and not only that but particularly property being such a you know we're we're, this is a cycle we're returning Mm. to cycles um you know and i i would certainly hold the view that we are past the top of a cycle and possibly on the way down and the reality is that people who aren't motivated from uh, uh, from a place of passion they're not going to stay in this industry because the uncertainty the reward isn't there and the uncertainty is too high and they didn't did they in sort of uh, around the last recession as well it was you know people were coming into the industry because it was a cash cow it was a great way to make money they weren't necessarily interested in in, yeah. in, in well, particularly if they if there's a low level of qualification and no regulation. Precisely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the the the, the elephant in the room at the moment now is in, in the UK. Mm. Uh, in a few minutes, in a few minutes, how are you reacting to the Brexit? M- me situation? personally. Well, the, 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 the England and the whole economy in the UK and nobody uh, knows. I think is probably the honest answer. I mean, we can have discussions about it all day long, and there's lots of forums where we're sitting and discussing what could come next. But I don't think anybody is fully is aware. Is it affecting your business? Uh, in a positive way, it's affecting in, in mine way. personally. Yeah. So, so I think what what came about from that conversation from from businesses that we're now reassessing is that they realised the areas where they needed to strengthen. So, as an agency that specialises in helping people find the top ten percent and identify the top ten percent of the next generation, yeah. I think recruitment became far more important. I called it bum on a seat recruitment. Bum on a seat recruitment didn't work anymore. You it, you couldn't afford to just say I'll hire ten of them and three of them are still here in twelve months. Then great because they're going to have an impact on your business. And now people are watching the pounds. So every investment they make in a oh, business, be that prop tech, marketing, talent, it has to be on point. Right. Um, so at that point, they've now moved away from, a lot of companies are moving away from, let's just try and see, okay. to no, we have to be certain that this right. is the right investment. So it must be very cautious scene over there. Completely very yeah, there is a lot of caution going on, but in in any sort of uh, difficult market, there's always opportunities. Because mm. I see growth was pretty much down last month as well. In, in April, I think it was. Like so a prime example, for example, was I was speaking with a client a few weeks ago and he was talking about his marketing um, within, um, he was talking about his marketing within the local market for London. Yet when you look at it, I think it was like 65, 70% of the the traditional sales that have been happening over the past quarter had been to overseas investors. So if you're spending 100% of your marketing budget on the local London market and 70% of the buyers are coming from overseas, it doesn't take a genius to work out you're missing a trick. Yeah, Yeah. Uh, there's there's a total mismatch. Um, There's no joined up thinking in that. Phil, before we let you go... Mm. One one top t- tip for the property companies listening in: how to attract the very top talent in in one in one point. <laughs> in one point, if I had to say how Your to attract top tip. the very top talent is be clear on who you are and what you want, and be honest about it. As a company, too, t- yes. Too many companies will write adverts and profiles that just look like everybody else's. If you have something that you believe in, if you have something that you stand for. Fly that flag, be very clear about what that is and make sure that you're attracting people to your business that share the same philosophy. And it's as simple as that. That's so true. Listen, wise words, bring the passion back into property. Um, That was Phil Pelucha. That's the one. Uh, from number one property group. Phil, thank you so much for joining us and safe travels back to the UK. Thank you so much. Your community radio for South Dublin. This is Dublin South FM. And this is Dublin South FM with Property Matters. And... Uh, 
with the uh, myself here in uh, Brian Fox and Carol Tallon. On Twitter, it's iProperty Radio. On email, it's hello at iPropertyRadio.com. Now in studio, we have Fiak Morrison. He's a strategic hypnotherapist, counsellor and mind coach and founder of the Dublin, Dublin Hypnosis and Therapy Centre bit of a mouthful but there and it's, it's kind of stressful as I as I looked at it to see what what, what I what if I get it right um, but there are many aspects of stress let's just talk about negative stress okay negative stress is um, it, it's just one I, I suppose one one end of the spectrum of of the stress um, the negative stress um, has has huge implications um, both physical physiological and emotional and the the, the challenge with with stress um, in on that end of the spectrum is that it has huge effects on people's well-being, their own mental health, mm. and their um, their way of life. So, um, so like just in physical, like you have that you know kind of the, the fight or flight, which which is the the reaction that their our base reaction, and it in the physical sense is it does have that that freezing of of, of ideas of of. of of um, the whole physicality, but on the physiological, you have the pains and this, the, you know, disorders that come straight from there. But also on the, it also has a huge effect on our own um, uh, the, the emotional um, end because we have the anxieties, fears, angers, and frustrations that we all go through. But it's when we focus on it and just end up see building this um, stress up as a big monster, as mm. a big part of, of our lives that becomes too big mm. for us to handle. Mm. Well, you that's know? when it be, that's, is when it becomes a problem. That's when it, it becomes that, that, that That's when you've got then. to go and see a GP or someone like that. Yeah, yeah. And or yourself. Well, like, I mean, yeah, like, I mean, usually kind of like when people are going through these, um, the, the, these issues, um, sometimes the, the, the GP would be their first mm. port of call. Mm. Um, but in our in in, in our clinic, um, th- we we deal with with all of those. We mm. help people to to tap into the some of the, the I suppose the hidden strengths that they do have, mm. so that they can use those strengths to mm. to 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 work through. Mm. But stress. people associate stress very negatively. There is also positive stress as well, isn't there? Like I mean, before we come in here, we're obviously preparing a program and there's a certain amount to get it right. Absolutely, and, and like mm. I me, mean, and and uh, even at this time of the year, like when when exams are going on, like I mean, there is going to be that natural mm. stress. Mm. And stress isn't. It's it's really just there as as I suppose as, as a signpost to, to give you an impetus, to give you a direction on what you need to do, mm. because this stress can be can can stimulate the creativity. And to give you kind of ways of, of working around and to giving you new directions, because when when people have um, have have any issues around stress um, or wh- where stress is a big factor, that they can learn to manage it or they can learn to work through it or just to, 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 to deal with it in a way that's. Just, just, yeah. just, but just yeah. to expand on working through it, or, or working through stress. Well, how how would best is it work to work through stress? Would well, stress is um, like working through it is is quite a, I suppose, a challenging um, part of life because working through it is in dealing with it and. I suppose identifying it for what it is. Mm. It's there purely as as. as 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 a as a response as a as a physical response to um to things that are either going going wrong or that need to be done yeah. okay now working working through stress um and because i suppose principally because it has such a huge impact on 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 mental health um that working through it is such a very important um part of 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 what we have to do and in the in our hyp- hypnotherapy clinic, where we deal with, we, we help people to identify what they want, okay? Because once once they have an idea of where what they what they really want and where they what direction they want to go in their what life, what they want in, in life in life, yeah, mm. um, to re to reprioritize what's what's going on because mm. a lot of the time because we focus on the career on the small mm-hmm. little things mm-hmm. and the things that are th- that okay might be somewhat important but they're they go o- out of um, out of sync with yeah. what they really want. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point <coughs> as in bringing it back to actually giving people the space and the time to ask what they want because look, um, thank you so much for being with us again, Fiacre. You know, as you know, you've been in to the show before purely because this is something that's so important because within the industry, right across the planning, construction and property industries, um, 
stress is something we see manifesting all the time and I think it's interesting to hear you talk about how stress actually can be a positive and stimulate creativity because that actually makes sense to me. You know, when I look across, particularly across property developers, you know, people who are involved, you know, right across from in terms of planning and architecture, these are very creative people and they seem to live in a constant state of heightened stress. They're constantly rushing, constantly under pressure, anxiety. constantly mm-hmm. deadline. But see, it's not even anxiety. These are confident people at the top of their game, but they're go, go, go. And You know, so I can definitely see how stress will stimulate creativity. But are we getting to a place then where we normalise it within the industry that we see that this is the only way to be this constant busyness, this constant flurry of activity? Because, you know, even the the simple act of stepping back and actually thinking, what do I want? Mm. I think that's very difficult for some people, particularly if you're um, a business owner Mm. within this industry, because... Your responsibility, you know, in a lot of cases is going to be to provide for your family, but it's also to provide for your employees, to to provide for your mm-hmm. project stakeholders. You know, what we see in the industry a lot are people, male and female, who are carrying mountains of responsibility, so much responsibility constantly because it moves from one project to another. So how do you identify where the stress is good and stimulating creativity and where we're maybe normalising a very uh, destructive stress that is keeping you in a state that your body can't come out of this fight or flight Mm -hmm. to actually relax. Well, when in in that state of busyness and productivity and creative um, ideas and that like that is again, it is stressful, but it's also um, in uh, what would you say it's um, it's fulfilling. OK, and those who are in at that level, who are able to, to take on whatever it is and be fulfilled and be able to have a st- still got a healthy, um, balanced life, um, because really that's what what it's all about is having that control and balance in your life that um, that that m- some people can can deal with very well and they have a good work life work life um, balance. So. It's when it's down at the other end of the scale where people are going through the challenges of their, you know, whether it's um, whether they are um, a business owner with the huge responsibilities that Mm. they that they um, bring. But as you said, like for their employees and for their own families, um, it's being when their work life balance becomes affected when, when they can't take the time off when they're under that severe pressure, when there's a mounting um, environment of 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 uncertainty. Yeah. Um, and it's when they're at that stage, that's where that mental health issues start beginning um, to become a factor. Yeah. And, um, um, and probably because this is such an uncertain industry, uncertainty mm-hmm. is probably the certainty of it. And, you know, one of the things that I see because there's a lot of um, self-employed people in mm-hmm. this industry. They tend to be, even if they're working with large companies, actually they could be subcontractors, so they're essentially still self-employed. Um, even leaders of very large companies, and I don't think maybe people appreciate this or realise this so much, but even when you're leading, you know, even when you have a family there and you're leading a large company, it can still mm-hmm. be a very lonely place to be when the decisions in, in the part and the responsibility lands on your shoulders. It mm-hmm. c- you know, taking time out can feel almost indulgent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. As yeah. Irish people, yeah. are we good at taking time out? Um, for, for, for I think in the most case, no. Um, that we, we're always looking. We're always tr- trying to, 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 to get ahead, mm-hmm. trying to kind of just, just keep ahead of, of, of the mm-hmm. next bill or the next yeah. um, job or the next contract. And with that in mind, while being at that, that up at the top, up at those top um, tiers, yes, it is very lonely and it's it can be very difficult. But be, have, having again, keeping in mind of that that work life balance and having the time for yourself. Now, the, while 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 the work and the business is is important, that it's much more important to take the time, and mm-hmm. it's the realization of that. To allow the to the de- 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 stress to take the the time, whether it's on a hobby, whether it's just to take go for a walk or go, something. Yeah, d- doing exercise and, and yeah. a lot of people do it. The golf, yeah. um, whether it's golf or kind of the 
you know, and it's interesting you talk about that because um, there's somebody, you know, we were discussing this a couple of weeks ago about how, you know, people who are very driven and very task orientated, that sometimes they can feel guilty or they don't like taking time away. So, in fact, uh, one therapist spoke ha- about a client that she had that just felt that if he wasn't working on his business, he should be with his family. When he's not with his family, he should be w- working on his business. Mm-hmm. And they were his two priorities. And he felt that if he was doing anything else, um, almost that he was indulging or mm. that you know that that he wasn't fulfilling his his duties as a so man. yeah well mm. uh, well as a person as a business owner as a husband you know for all of these well, I roles I do think there's a difference there I, as well do, myself I, do you know I do I, I think I would agree with that but in fact so what the therapist did was that she actually incorporated as one of his tasks one of the things he had to achieve that week was a, a full round of golf mm. so that was one of his oh, yeah. tasks mm-hmm. yeah. so that was on the, the list it had to be achieved and in fact that that's something like that there are techniques like that that yeah. work even if it's just to give the space <clears throat> to allow a habit mm. to develop but actually I think I, look I think that's a very fair point I do think there's a difference between men and women and how we approach mm. stress mm, Absolutely and I'm just going to talk about my own experience too because um, I worked for a while in public television in the United States and back then, uh, it probably, it probably don't remember this, uh, the, the contract with America came out, which was to completely devastate public television's budgets. And the place was devastated by it. And now in Ireland, as you, as you all know, there's lots of closures with the newspapers. Mm-hmm. And with, with, so this, and, and, you know, you're talking about people. I mean, most of the, my colleagues in the Leinster House would be 14 hour days. Mm-hmm. There would yeah. be, you know, that that's 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 routine. Twelve, fourteen hour days. So my point is, and again, I know a lot of people now that have, mm-hmm. that have, uh, you know, you've, you've heard about recent cuts too that have been laid off at fifty five. So I mean, there is quite a lot of anxiety out there in, in the workplace, not just in construction, but also in 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 uh, mm-hmm. other areas as mm-hmm. well. And this is the real life. <clears throat> this is life as as it is now in the like in in, in the twenty fourth century, mm-hmm. and we live in with that uncertainty, and people who have had. Um, that ha- have had their lives kind of like in 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 a particular industry, mm-hmm. and see the threat of well, it could change, mm-hmm. and it's like, what do I do? Yeah, and how do I cope? And yeah. how do I actually provide then for, yeah. Yeah. you know, for for, for, for their own particularly once you go past f- you know forty five fifty exactly as well, yeah, you know? and, and they feel, people feel unemployable and yeah. unneeded, and and that again builds up its its, its own um, challenges. Indeed, and inferiorities yeah. as well in terms yeah. of. Your, yeah. your, you know how, how you see life and society mm-hmm. and so forth. You know, so there, so your your place in in society becomes so much different. That with that unsurety, with that, and 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 that's one thing that we that we do deal with in in our practice. Yeah. Um, and, and because when people come come into us, they're normally coming in as a, as a last resort. They normally come in because they've tried everything else. Yeah. They've been down the medication route and yeah. and they're still not getting yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's that they feel that they're so kind of confined that they're trapped that they're mm-hmm. they're caught mm-hmm. in that system. Mm-hmm. And like in, in in just in a very very basic way that we can actually help them to to tap into some of those to well to break out of the the mindset mm-hmm. because it's the mindset that keeps them locked in mm-hmm. that keeps them tied. And with the dynamic therapy that that we have Indeed. in hip the hypnotherapy, but, but the, the mind lock is difficult because there's responsibilities towards Absolutely. family and towards yeah. themselves, and that will always be there. Mm. But it's it's how they see it, how, how they, they how they it, are yeah. actually able to kind of because it's it's still going to be a challenge, mm. and life isn't going to be perfect. Even like w- w- with the, with the best of treatments, mm. um, life is still going to have its 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 ups and downs. But it's developing a mindset that will guide you through it and allow you to to achieve those um, we could go, I'd love to go yeah. on to the medication route with you okay. yeah, well maybe we'll do that some other time uh, you know look it, it really occurs to me that when you're talking about all these things it, it just reminds the importance of resilience mm-hmm. and resilience I think it's always good to keep in mind it's muscle yeah. it requires being built and it's not always easy in fact it can be quite a painful muscle to build mm-hmm. that's right um, yeah. okay Fiacra thank you so much you might just let us know your website so people know where to contact you well it's um, it's it's hypnosisandtherapy.ie and um, where our, our, our clinic is um, just on Fitzwilliam Street Lower just um, uh, and the website is hypnosis hypnosisandtherapy.ie Excellent. Okay, that was Fiacre Morrison, strategic hypnotherapist, counsellor and mind coach and of course founder of the Dublin Hypnosis and Therapy Clinic. Thank you so much and thank you to all of our guests today who joined Brian Fox and myself, Carol Tallon and thank you to uh, Shane Flynn who is on sound, our producer Katie Tallon and next up is Bowl of Soul. 